we going to get this thing started? Are we going to do this? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to do it. You know why we're going to do it? Because this, 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 this won't hurt a bit. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're back. Episode four, and we're excited about it. We're excited because despite the title, we think that there's some stuff in here that's really empowering. Empowering both psychologically and actually physically. There's some stuff we want to teach you. And there's some stuff that you should learn that could really change your life, that could even save a life. And on that note, let's begin with our first story. Every second of every single day, people pass from life to death. We're all going to do that transition. We don't know when. We don't know how. But we all know that it's going to come. But sometimes it comes too soon. And sometimes, the rarest of times, it can be prevented. My family, I have two, two younger daughters, two and five years old, and, and my wife. We were at a friend's house and uh, we were there kind of for like a celebration kind of day. She has a really nice big house. She invited a bunch of friends over and their families. And That's Jason, Jason Hal, Pretty famous guy in the world of the internet. Works for Twit. He's a producer. This is his story. You know, a very nice big swimming pool of which we were <laughs> taking advantage and swimming and eating and all that all throughout the day. Um, and I guess it was starting to get a little bit darker outside. We'd, we'd had a lot of fun all day long, uh, very loose by that point. And uh, I decided to go ahead and get in the pool and swim some laps. I, I don't really normally swim laps. I had a s- shoulder surgery you know, years ago. And my experience in the pool has been, I can swim, I can keep myself afloat, but doing true laps, doing the motion of of swimming laps doesn't really come very natural to me. But earlier that day, I realized if I was wearing goggles, uh, for some reason it made it easier because I could kind of focus on swimming and not worry about, you know, my contact lenses falling out of my eyes or whatever. So I was like, all right, I think I'm going to jump in and do that. So unplanned, unexpected, Jason goes for a swim. There on the other side of the pool, on the very bottom of the pool, was kind of a a blackish form. I couldn't really tell if it was furniture or if it was a body or what it was, but all I know is my immediate instinct was to swim as fast as I could underwater and get to whatever it was and uh, check it out. I know that at that point, adrenaline probably just rushed right into me um, because my immediate reaction was to get over there and do whatever needed to be done. Stayed underwater. It was not difficult to hold my breath the entire way. I swam from one side of the pool to the other, uh, got closer. My, my immediate reaction was, okay, that's not one of my daughters, uh, but it is, it is a, a boy. It was uh, basically our friend's uh, young uh, son. He's probably, I think he's three or four years old. He was, you know, he was lying on the bottom of the pool in, the, in a way that someone would be lying on a bed. It was just lying face down, uh, completely still, right near the drain, uh, completely lifeless. And so I swam down to him and lifted him up and, you know, surfaced. Came up above the water and just my reaction was to yell as loud as I could repeatedly, help, I need help, I need help, right now, help, 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 just that word, repeat that word and someone's going to realize I'm not joking and I'm telling, uh, I'm, I'm saying something very serious. And uh, his parents, his mom is a nurse, his dad works in fitness, uh, they were very close nearby, they were within, uh, you know, 10 feet or so, so I mean immediately after yelling help for a few seconds, they were pulling him out of my arms and laying him on the side of the pool. And he's like a rag doll. He was uh, grayish blue, I would say, if even blue. It was really just kind of a, a total gray color to his skin. And, you know, visibly you would look at him and you would immediately think, that boy is dead. And usually that's the end of the story. And what follows is funerals and grief that, to most of us, is unimaginable. But not this time. His parents proceeded to uh, administer CPR. He lied on the side of the boy uh, to be the one to kind of give him breath as needed. 
uh, and she, who's the nurse, she was on top of the boy uh, doing the chest compressions. Super obvious that they knew what they were doing, right? Because they had their system down. I mean, she was immediately. They kind of took their spe- their spots. She immediately started doing chest compressions at a very, you know, pretty rapid pace, counting to thirty loudly. One, two, three, four. You know, going through the whole process. At thirty, you know, she yelled, "Breathe!" And uh, he he knelt down and gave two to three breaths, and she continued. They continued for two minutes, and then this happened. He had the little twitchy motion, um, <laughs> to which I, I specifically remember yelling out, holy crap, he's moving, he's moving. Uh, and then to see him vomit, <laughs> it was the most beautiful vomit in the world. <laughs> Not to make light of it, but you see that and you realize like, okay, it's working. You know, you, you, His parents are literally bringing him back to life from death. You know what am I doing right now? I'm just, I'm just looking for like animals, like lizards or snakes. That's my new friend Emmett. He's back at school. He's back at swim lessons. He's playing with his lizards. And how important is CPR to this story? Well, let's ask his mum, Sadie. It changed everything. I mean, it was the thing that it's the reason that we still have him because he was from all that I could tell, dead. I mean, he was blue, he was not breathing, his heart wasn't beating. I don't know what would have happened, and I don't like to think about what would have happened, but, you know, in the moment, I didn't really think about what could have happened. I just just knew exactly what to do. I think that if anyone is ever around water, whether it's your kids, whether you have kids, whether it's an adult, if you know that and you could step in, and help them, then you could bring someone back. You could save someone in the same way that we did. I've asked myself so many times what I could have done as his parent to protect him from this, like how I could have prevented this. And and there's been a lot of like coming to terms with accountability for me. I almost think that having more people around makes it more likely to happen because there was a dozen adults within, you know, a couple feet of him. There were people in the pool, there were people around the pool. I was standing close by watching, and I just literally turned my head for what felt like, you know, a minute. It's just, it's silent, and it happens in an instant. Learning CPR and understanding the process of CPR is not hard, and it does not take a lot of time. It's a skill that you can you can learn relatively quickly, um, and in many cases, completely free. Uh, And basically what you're giving yourself is a Superman cape. You're giving yourself the power to resurrect somebody from death to life. If everybody knew how to do that, man, just think of the lives, the amount of lives that would be saved. Thanks, Mel. And thanks to Jason, Sadie, and Emmett for sharing their story. Well, it's really, really hard to transition from a story like that. Here you have a child that is basically dead, is dead. And just because the timing's right and there were people who could do fast CPR, he gets his second chance. But I think it's really important to stress how rare this outcome is. More often than not, it doesn't turn out that way. But what is CPR? What does it actually do? Why do we do it? Mel and I sit down with Dave Mason for a quick discussion. And actually, we start this with a little bit of a cruel test, actually. Dave, what does CPR stand for? Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. You yeah. sir! Yeah. <laughs> Our genius. I'm dropping a mic because somewhere. As I, uh, as I asked that, I'm like, I wonder what that stands for. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'll it I'm impressed. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so <laughs> cardio, heart, pulmonary, lungs, resuscitation. Uh, Do to, it again and again until to bring back you don't have to anymore. Dead or something <laughs> um, so what were your questions? Well, one I had was just the why it even works. Why pressing on somebody's chest even works. What is it doing? What exactly am I pressing to get going or to get moving or to squash or squeeze. I, I just don't understand the whole thing. So I'll explain it in simple terms. And I don't think they're too simple because this is how actually I think about it. So your heart's just a pump and it's 
hollow and there's blood in it okay. and it just pumps and it sends blood to your lungs so that it can get oxygen and it sends the rest of the blood to the body to send the oxygen to the cells and everything else. So when you press on somebody's chest, you're physically taking that uh, balloon-like structure and squishing it and when you squish it like that the blood flies out to the places it should go and then when you let go unlike a balloon it actually is elastic and will pump itself up again so that's part of what you're doing you're physically just squishing this pump and pumping for it because it can't pump for itself right now the other thing that's happening is that your lungs your chest is like this big bellows and if i squish your lungs and chest then that's going to help press the blood out from the chest to the rest of the body, to the brain, to the legs and everywhere else. And then uh, because there's elasticity in that chest, as you let go from doing your chest compression, then that creates sort of a vacuum within your chest. And that means you're going to suck in blood from your legs and your arms back into your heart. And it's also going to mean that uh, you're going to suck in a little air too. It's going to go... As you let the go. The person. The person. Oh. Maybe you too because you're getting really short of breath because yeah. you're doing all the work. <laughs> okay. So just by the sort of bellows action of squishing the heart and the bellows action of the chest wall, you're actually circulating blood around the person's body. Now, it's much less effective than if you have a real heart that's pumping for you, but we don't need it to be 100% effective. We'd like it to be, but we just need it to be enough so that we can get enough oxygen either to your brain while we're waiting for some way to restart your heart um, or for your heart to start itself, which certainly can happen. So your heart's not pumping or not pumping properly or mm-hmm. it's irregular, and we're just trying to get enough time to do an intervention. So two things can happen, and I'll use two examples. So one is the boy we heard about. So generally young people, when they have a cardiac arrest, they die. It's because of a respiratory cause. They weren't breathing, like he couldn't breathe because he was underwater. Then their heart stops. But if you get them early enough and you do the CPR and you can circulate blood to the heart itself, actually, the heart needs blood as well. So when you're doing this, you're actually getting blood back to the heart. It's probably the most important thing. So the heart in a young person will say, okay, I'm still good and I want to start beating again. And you've given me some oxygen and I needed that for fuel and I'll just start up again. And, and just like in this kid's case, the heart starts again and you're like, thank you. For older people, usually the problem is an electrical problem. So... Too many hamburgers, no exercise. You've got, you develop these blockages in your vessels that supply blood to your heart. And then you can have these arrhythmic events. So as that heart muscle's dying, it can set up a situation where there's sort of an electrical storm within your heart. And instead of all of those muscle cells contracting together, going boom, 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 and they're all con- controlled and doing it together nice and rhythmically, and that's how you're pumping. They go into a thing called fibrillation where everybody's firing. All the muscle cells are doing that. And that's uncoordinated and the heart doesn't pump properly. It's just sort of wriggling around like a bag of worms. And uh, so in those patients, you can potentially get them back if you put electricity through them. So that's what you see on the TV shows. They take the electricity and they go, boom. And what's that doing is telling all those heart cells, stop firing. Stop it. Boop. And they all stop. Wait, so that machine is to stop the heart. Yeah, so Not it's to start it. Well, it's going to tell all of those things that are firing off stop. You just all need to stop your business, and it depolarizes them, so they stop their electrical activity because all of those heart cells have electrical activity. So that stops them, and then there's a couple of places in the heart that are the coordinators. They are the ones that like to start the rhythm. So the electrical impulses start in these areas of the heart and then they spread to the rest of the heart. So you're trying to get those areas that are supposed to be coordinating the boom, the boom, the boom. They start up again in the best case scenario. They start again. Okay, okay, guys, everybody follow me. One, a two, a three, a four. So that's what a cardio version or defibrillation is doing, is resetting it. It doesn't always work, of course. In fact, it doesn't work most of the time. But when it works, it's because you've got a heart that's good enough and uh, it wants to coordinate, it's healthy enough to start up again. So I was under the impression that the defibrillator started the heart. Yeah, that's what, it's what like, it oh, looks like. Oh, they dropped, they're dead, and nothing's it's like, moving. Ding. Warming up, don't touch the body. Whoosh. Yeah, But that's not what it's... No, it's not like you put that electricity through and then that makes the heart like contract and... Yeah. It's actually depolarizing it. It's making it just like... Oh. And then start again. Letting it start again on its own. Letting it start again. Because it wants to. It wants to. Yeah. If it's healthy enough, it wants right. to start again. If it doesn't have a cheeseburger in there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's, that could not be I good. mean, you, you've got people who've had very big heart attacks, lots of heart muscles dead. It's just done. And you can put a 
billion volts through them and you're not going to get anything. Mm. You're just giving it a chance to start again. And the only, you know, the only way to make a heart that's not beating beat that's dead is to put another heart in it. You know, because when your heart is dead, it's just like anything else that's dead. It's not going to come back. A trillion volts. Frankenstein, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Not going to happen. So let me try and bring it together a little bit. Because we heard a story, a story about Emmett and how CPR done fast and done well saved his life. And it's important. It's important that we learn that skill. It's pretty easy. It's important because young people in particular, but people who are not so young, often have hearts that are too good to die. And we can do something about it. This next story is about a very different person. A person who's at the end of their life, when it is time for whatever comes next. Sometimes in medicine, we can lose perspective on what's really important. We can lose this because of all the technology in medicine, the fact that we are taught that we have to save every single patient. And it really comes down to doing procedures, giving medicines, and forgetting the big picture. My name is Daniela Lamas. I'm a fellow in pulmonary and critical care medicine um, here in Boston, which means that I'm learning to be an ICU doctor and a pulmonary doctor. So Daniela wrote a piece in the New York Times, and our producer Cece, she's going to read it for you now. My pager went off late one afternoon with a message from the oncology service at my hospital, asking me to see a 70-year-old man with metastatic cancer and trouble breathing. I wasn't hopeful. I had chosen to train in pulmonary and critical care medicine because I wanted to be someone who saved lives. But it turned out there was so much sickness I couldn't fix. The patient had worked as a mechanic. Vague pain led to a diagnosis of colon cancer that had travelled to his liver and lungs. Now he was short of breath and might have pneumonia. His team was asking me to arrange a procedure called a bronchoscopy in which we insert a small tube with a camera at the end down the throat in order to look inside the lungs and suck out a deep sample to help find out what's going wrong. We'll get him on the schedule for tomorrow, I sighed, suspecting that nothing I did would make him better. No food or drink after midnight. In the waiting area outside the procedure suite the next morning, I went through the usual consent forms. He would be asleep for the procedure. Thanks to sedative drugs, we would run through the intravenous line. We would make him feel pretty good, but he would remember none of it. Just imagine a really good martini. Or two. Or three, I joked. It was the first time I had noticed my patient smile. You know, I'm more of a Guinness man myself, he said. I remembered the first time I drank a Guinness, when I visited Ireland in medical school. And I thought now of those lazy afternoons, chatting with strangers, cosy inside a dark pub while it rained outside. All right, a Guinness then, I told him reassuringly. Something to look forward to when you get home. But days passed and he was still in that hospital room. The bronchoscopy didn't reveal why he couldn't breathe, as is often the case. Maybe it was pneumonia, maybe it was the spread of cancer itself, or a reaction to the chemotherapy. But my patient just kept getting sicker. His doctors decided that he might be too weak to eat or drink without food or water slipping down the wrong pipe into his lungs. They wrote orders to keep him from eating and drinking. When I saw him each morning, I listened dutifully to his lungs' unchanging cacophony of wheezes and crackles. And he told me how his mouth was dry like a desert. And I told him I was sorry. One morning, my patient's wife told me that he had decided against any more aggressive procedures. No more blood draws or chest x-rays or antibiotics. He was dying, and he didn't want to die with a breathing tube in the intensive care unit. The goal had shifted to making his remaining time as comfortable as possible. I stared at the sign still hanging behind his bed, NPO, from the Latin nil peros, or nothing by mouth, in bold black letters, warning his caregivers that he wasn't allowed to eat or drink. I told the medical student I was working with that we were going on a field trip to the liquor store. Won't we get in trouble? He asked. I hoped not, but I had promised my patient a beer when it was all done, and that was a promise I could keep. So that afternoon, we trooped to the liquor store across the street from the hospital and bought a cold bottle of Guinness Extra Stout, which the medical student tucked inside the pocket of his short white coat 
We giggled about the bulge of the smuggled beverage made in his coat as we rode the elevator back up to the patient's room. I pulled the nurse taking care of my patient into the hall and told her we had something to show her, gesturing to my medical student waiting anxiously in the corner. He slipped the bottle out from its hiding place. Okay with you? I asked the nurse. She nodded. I'd given my patient's wife a heads up earlier in the day. We were ready. All right, I said, let's do it. The hospital room was abuzz with the excitement of the illicit. We closed the curtains. My patient looked calmer, awake despite the morphine and breathing a little more comfortably. His wife was sitting at his bedside, awaiting our arrival. My medical student pulled the brown bag out of his coat with unexpected flourish. I figured I'd get you that Guinness, I promised, I said. I held it up to the patient's wife first, who nodded encouragingly, and then turned around and showed my patient. He smiled. A Guinness man, after all. It was only after I struggled with a cap that I realised none of us had a bottle opener. My medical student saw me casting about, grabbed the beer, and expertly flicked the bottle on the side of the table. We all laughed in surprise as drops of beer ran over the side of the bottle and onto his hands. The room smelt like a party. We poured some of the deep brown brew into a small cup and handed it to the patient's wife, who slowly wet her husband's dry lips. He licked his lips and closed his eyes as he tasted the beer. Is that okay, I asked. My patient gave me a thumbs up. I wish that I had known him better. Cheers, he said. Bottoms up, I replied. A few days later, my patient died in that room. There were no more procedures. I didn't save his life. I thought again of that first taste of Guinness I'd had while a medical student visiting Ireland. When you first sip a Guinness, you taste something crisp. But there's also the bitterness of hops, and then, behind the bitterness, the scent of caramel. And now, years out of medical school, when I think about being a doctor, I think of adrenaline and a rush of decisions and that hope of saving lives. But I also think of that moment in the hospital room. Love, a smuggled beverage shared around a bed. Alarm silenced, curtain closed. And since she wrote that story, Daniela's gotten feedback. A lot of feedback. It goes like this. Comments and these emails that I've gotten Um, are just these wonderful stories of what people wanted in these last days and what people brought them and somebody teaching a nurse how to mix a martini just right and somebody going out to God knows where to get somebody like a taste of their favorite sandwich and just these these really quiet, hidden, special moments. You know, I have wonderful memories that surround technology from that year too, but this one this one stands out because there was something about seeing somebody just be awesome and gracious and being part of this really cool, special moment that um, I felt really lucky to be there. So thanks to Dr. Lamas for her incredible story, for CC, our producer, for her reading. And for those of you who aren't afraid to break a few rules, because sometimes what a dying man needs is not more technology. Sometimes what a dying man needs is one last beer. All right, so we've talked about a kid who was too well to die, and we got him back. And we talked about a man, it was, a, it was his time. It was okay to let that person move on. But what about just sort of the amazing? Jess, you've got a story which I think is one of the most fascinating things I've ever heard. Yeah, I don't... I don't want to blow it. I want to get into the story, but this is a very different story than the other two. And it's more a story of survival than death. Can you survive death? Sounds like an oxymoron, but in some cases, it's true. We think of death as being final, a conclusive moment, like flipping a switch, an abrupt transition, But this, in fact, is not the case. Think of life, coma, and death as a spectrum. You can exist on different parts of this spectrum and in some rare cases, still have a chance to come back towards life. 
The most dramatic example of this is a doctor named Anna Bagenholm. However, Dr. Bagenholm was not the doctor in this case. She was actually the patient. The year was 1999. Anna was 29 years old, skiing with friends in Norway. When she fell, she got trapped between rocks and ice, and her body was submerged in icy water. Her friends were doing everything they could to rescue her, but they couldn't. After 40 minutes of struggling, Anna stopped moving. A rescue team arrived and pulled her body out. She was lifeless. They started CPR immediately and transported her by a helicopter to the closest ER. She arrived at the hospital 110 minutes after her fall. Her pupils were dilated, she was not breathing on her own, and she had no pulse. Anna was dead. There's a saying we have in medicine, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. Let me explain. Hypothermia slows down the metabolism. Think of it as putting the body into a state similar to hibernation. It's common procedure in the ER to try to resuscitate patients with hypothermia by warming them up. And in rare cases, they may survive. What's unique in Anna's case is how cold her body was and how long she was clinically dead. Anna's coldest body temperature was 56.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 13.7 degrees Celsius. Hypothermia starts to set in at 95 Fahrenheit, which is 32 degrees Celsius. Anna was put on a machine to circulate her blood and breathe for her, called cardiopulmonary bypass. It also warmed her blood before putting it back into her body. At two hours, 36 minutes, her heart started to beat. Anna still required surgery, warming, and resuscitation for several hours. After nine hours, she was brought to the intensive care unit. She remained on life support. After many weeks, Anna started to wake up. In fact, she was mentally alert. 60 days later, she was discharged from the hospital to a rehab center. Five months later, she had returned to work and was hiking and, yes, skiing again. It wasn't Anna's time. Her doctors didn't give up, and her body didn't give up. Anna's story is very rare and very special, and it makes us examine our concept of death and life. I think one of the things that is so hard for most people to get is how you can, as an ER doc, go in and maybe have a shift where like five or six or seven people die in the time that you're at work. Like we, most people have no concept of how to deal with that. Like, I mean, what what is that like for you guys? Um, there is no fooling yourself that you're gonna live forever. I think that's the single biggest thing that I come away with is, uh, Life is short and it's precious and you should make the most of it because we all, all end up in the same place. That's the one universal experience we're all going to have. And so there's just for many doctors and particularly for ER doctors, there is no, there's lots of existential angst about that, but it can be positive. You realize that uh, the difference between being alive and being dead can be a simple accident. It can be something that is not your fault at all and it can happen in an instant and uh, you should live your life knowing that uh, nobody gets out of this thing alive. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that's all we have time for this week. Next week on Second Opinion, we'll talk CPR and how it works, more on the mysteries of accidental hypothermia and how you can be dead for so long and come out the other end, basically, okay, and then a new episode coming up in a few weeks called Up in Smoke. You can imagine what that puppy is about. Original music this episode was by Matt Eccles and the group Evil J and St. Cecilia. Special thanks, of course, to Jason Howell, to Emmett and Sadie, and to Dr. Lamas. 
This Won't Hurt a Bit is a production of Fooly Boo Incorporated, produced by CeCe Herbert and Bill Connor. The information you hear on This Won't Hurt a Bit should not be taken as actual medical advice. If you have actual medical questions about actual medical things, you should see an actual medical practitioner. Even though we are actually doctors, we're not your actual doctor, so be sensible and keep it real. And this... Oh, this. 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 This.